Mr. President, I had the privilege to listen to my colleague from California's oration, and the privilege to hear many of the things spoken both by the President and by colleagues here in the Senate as regards the voting rights bill which is here before us today. And I, I want to start off with the President's comments because I think it frames the debate, if you will, in terms of uh, how it's being framed to the American people. The President considered Georgia Jim Crow law, their, their new law is Jim Crow. Uh, and it's a manipulative statement. It is a cynical statement. It tries to make people think that 2022 is the same as 1965 laced with incredible irony as our country has seen an African-American president, an African-American vice president, a lieutenant governor of Virginia and Kentucky who are African-American, and to brag on my own state, as long as things are being seen through certain prisms, Louisiana, who had someone who was ethnically from India as our governor, the first Vietnamese American elected to the United States Congress, and multiple, in fact, Louisiana has had a white elected mayor of predominantly African-American New Orleans and a black elected mayor of predominantly white Baton Rouge. But no, this statement is somehow manipulating people think, to think that we're back in Bull Connor days. Well, if this is Jim Crow, then states like Delaware must be Jim Crow 2.0. Why is there not an outcry against Delaware? I point out that Georgia has more permissive voting laws than Delaware, more early voting days than Delaware, no excuse absentee voting, which, by the way, the voters of New York recently rejected. Georgia now makes ballot drop boxes permanent, which was not the case before the pandemic. Much has been made about restricting the number of drop boxes. Uh, I've been told that the one county pointed to is actually a ruby red Republican county in which they dropped down to one. If this is being done for partisan advantage, my gosh, they're not doing a very good job of partisan maneuvering. But I would argue that this bill is a wonderful example of partisan maneuvering. What does it do? It's a federal takeover of elections. The innovation that the previous speaker, my colleague from California, was speaking of now has to run the gamut of a federal official who says yay or who says nay. It funnels tax dollars to fund political campaigns, no matter how fringe that person's perspective might be, who no self-respecting donor would give money to online or in person. But because of this law, my gosh, they got a chance. It bans common sense voter ID laws. Now, there's this kind of myth being promulgated that states are putting up these onerous laws that cannot be complied with. Courts reject those laws. Courts do not allow a state to use a mandated picture ID issued by the state as an ID. And to say so is manipulative. It is manipulative in the worst way. Courts decide the threshold, and courts decide what is reasonable and is unreasonable. And to suggest otherwise one more time is an attempt to manipulate people into thinking that 2022 is 1965, with all the implications thereof and all the harm that does to our body politic. Shame. It also allows unlimited ballot harvesting which I think California might be the only state to have in place, where you can go to a homeless shelter and have people sign up who might be addicted, mentally ill, uh, brain damaged, and have them sign for a certain candidate. Now, you can imagine a well-paid activist, because this bill allows activists to be paid, might discard those ballots which are not for her candidate and keep only those for their own candidate. This bill requires that all 50 states have it, whereas, whereas North Carolina, they actually booted a candidate because he used ballot harvesting. It also prohibits states from cleaning up their voter rolls. Now, somehow, this is now wrong. 
I actually come from Louisiana, a, a state hit by Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And after 2005, it is a tragedy for my state. But we had tens of thousands of people who moved to other states. Now, at some point, they registered to vote in Atlanta or Houston or Dallas. And our Secretary of State went back and said, hmm, you're on a voter roll in Louisiana and you're on a voter roll in Georgia. Uh, it appears that you're now paying taxes in Georgia. We're going to drop you from our rolls. Is anything wrong with that? Is anything wrong with pointing out that somebody is registered to vote in two different states and then saying you're paying taxes there, so we're going to remove you from our rolls here? Lastly, I will say it puts Democrats in charge of the FEC, a neutral organization enforcing voter laws. Uh, I can imagine as soon as Republicans take charge again, we're going to do the same thing back to the other side. We're going to attempt to manipulate voting laws to our advantage. And it is not above either party to do that. So I hate to use this word, but to sanctimoniously declare that this bill is the end of history, that partisanship is behind us, that by golly these laws are going to be put in place and forever after we're going to live harmoniously, is to not understand Washington, D.C., where every edge is sought, and whenever it is sought, it is exploited to keep your particular party in power. And I say this as a Republican, I don't trust my party any more than I trust their party. I trust the states and the courts to oversee them, but this bill usurps that responsibility. Now, you can say that maybe this power grab is merely in place to distract from real issues. And there's something to be said for that. We're debating this, whether or not to require all 50 states to allow ballot harvesting when we have the highest rate of inflation than we've had in over 40 years, in which Russians are about to invade Ukraine, apparently, in which there's people pouring across our southern border, and there's a looming humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, and COVID response kind of being caught up with not being preemptively addressed, and we're discussing this. <sighs> Let me mention one more thing, Mr. President, the filibuster. I was in an interview today about the surprise medical billing bill. My colleague from New Hampshire, who I think was in the chamber earlier, helped put that together. Multiple colleagues ended up coming together on that. It took us two to three years to get it done. Surprise medical billing. As of January 1 of this year, if you get a surprise medical billing, there's a 1-800 number to call, and you get help. Why did it take us two years? We had to listen to stakeholders. We had to get legislation that worked for all. We had to go to this Republican, that Democrat, this committee in the Senate, that committee in the House, working with a broad coalition, even maybe at the end it's slipping away, but we managed to pull it back together and we passed a prize medical billing, and it was better because of that process. Now, that's in contrast to a bill in which a majority of Democrats in the House and the Senate with the President can force it through without any input from Republicans, from the 50% of the United States that voted for the other side. Well, let's guess whose advantage that bill is going to be for. Doesn't take much to imagine it. And what Mitt Romney said on a Sunday morning show, did the White House ever call you about this voting bill? And Mitt Romney said, never called me. That made it clear there was no effort to make this bipartisan. Now, we're going to break this 200-year-old filibuster that requires us to come together to find common ground that gives us bills that are stronger because of it, because of a desire for partisan advantage. And knowing that once we break it and Republicans take it back, we're going to use it the same way. This is wrong. This is wrong for our country. It is wrong for our institution. And I suppose that's why 16 of my Democratic colleagues signed a, year last, signed a letter last year, when, by the way, Republicans were in control, saying that we should preserve the filibuster. It was recently stated, there's a disease of division 
infecting our country. That's true. And blowing up the filibuster removes one of the last things that makes us come together. And that is wrong, and that will be tragic, however, however it is framed. With that, Mr. President, I yield. President.